Hi, I'm Mike. Um, so it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm going to uh, talk for a few minutes. I'm going to show you a video. And then I'm going to uh, show you some slides and talk about the work that I've been doing uh, over the past 25 or 30 years and the uh, work that I'm trying to work on right now. Um, and uh, well, let me just a ask a question here. If, if I were to ask you what um, one word to describe a movement, is there a word that comes to mind? Movement, like a, you know, the civil rights movement or any kind of movement. Anybody? Okay, that's good. I've got a, a very vocal crowd. <laughs> so uh, um, later on, I'm going to talk about the work that I'm doing now, which, and that is trying to uh, bring together uh, the 16,000 plus environmental organizations that work in the United States on environmental issues in order to try and bring us to a new place because we're living in a, in a new time in history and it's, you know, some might say it's the new world order. And uh, in order to get to that new world order, we're going to have to sort of think differently and act differently. But first, um, just a brief bio. Uh, yep, I'm, um, and also a caveat. I'm a practitioner. I've, you know, I've been working uh, in conservation organizations, with conservation organizations since the early 1980s. Um, and uh, that's my field. That's what I know. I do have an MBA, and I understand both sides of the story. I'm a little clumsy as a speaker. I might run ahead of myself. I might segue into some different areas. So, and, I, and even though I'm not from New York originally, I, I can speak like a New Yorker. So you're going to have to really like pay attention. Otherwise, uh, well, I won't understand myself, and so you'll have to find a way to understand yourself. So I started the Rainforest Alliance when I was uh, just a year or so out of school, and uh, I did it totally by mistake. Uh, I learned about rainforest when I was in college, and then I went over to China, and I started reading these articles about deforestation and tropical forest, and, and I felt like there were, there were no organizations that were available to help at that time. And you know, I, I was somewhat idealistic in college, and I said, if, a, if ever there was a time and a place that I could be a voice for the people's plants and animals of the rainforest that have no voice, then I would like to, to help. And uh, I ended up in New York a couple of years later working for a Wall Street law firm and went to a little workshop on rainforest and uh, uh, asked the person next to me if you were ready. He, was, he was ready to do something about it. So we started asking all the different organizations if they wanted some, you know, some passionate volunteers in, in New York. And they all said, no. None of them were interested in having us. And only as a last resort did we, did we start the Rainforest Alliance, originally as the New York Rainforest Alliance, as an educational organization. Uh, time passed. We held a major workshop, a conference in 1987. In 1989, we started a program called Smartwood. And it was the world's first forestry certification program. That is, we were trying to work with companies to better manage forest lands in tropical forests. And it was really hard. We spent 18 months on the first certification, which was uh, an area in, in Indonesia called Perin Perintani. It was a government-run teak plantation. It was our first certified, land, first certified operation, and it was also our first decertified operation. Because the part of certification, part of any kind of working with uh, environmental areas in the tropics of the United States, is the way that they treat people. This government operation didn't treat their people very well, so we took away that certification. However, the concept of independent third-party certification uh, started to catch on. A group called the Forest Stewardship Council sprung up. We helped start them, and they were to certify the certifiers in wood and forest products. And later on, we started working in other agricultural products like bananas and coffee and chocolate. And our goal was to develop a win-win, right? We're trying to work on the ground in tropical forests or in other areas to support local communities, better manage forests, better manage ag areas, and on the, on, on the other side, to work with companies to better behave, to, to better understand what sustainability means, to offer their consumers uh, a product that would be good for the planet for, uh, for the long term so that we would have sustainability and we would be able to uh, create sustainability throughout the United States, throughout the rest of the world for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that's the way when I started uh, creating the Rainforest Alliance a long time ago, 
how I would gauge our success. And that would be looking 50 years out, 100 years out. And you know, at the time, I was in my mid-20s, and I was pretty naive and inexperienced. And, uh, and so now it's 25 years later. And we have 25 years of a track record to, to gauge our success. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, so you know, we've been doing a lot of different things and a lot of different products. And uh, to celebrate our 25 years, uh, well, we've been doing a lot of different activities. We've been having events. I was in London and, and Turin, Italy a couple of weeks ago. And many years ago, we were doing all these events. Many years ago, uh, we, had these, uh, we had these roasts. We had celebrity roasts. We roasted uh, Ted Turner. We roasted the writer Peter Matheson. We roasted um, Jane Goodall. You know, these are supposed to be funny events. Jane Goodall, everybody cried. <laughs> it was really pretty funny. But, but the, at, at the time, the New, York, the New York Times dubbed us the conservation organization with a sense of humor which I was really proud of because I always thought when you work in, in the field of conservation and you're trying to protect rainforests, you never go home at the end of the day going, well, my job is done. Um, but I'm going to show you this little video um, just to, well, just to show you what we're working on right now. So let's see if it works. You are a good person. You spend time with your family. You work out at the gym. Come on, push, push. You conserve water while showering. You like nice clothes. You give to charity. You recycle. You drive a Prius, but you use your bike when you can. You enjoy the occasional distraction at work. And you always send a card on Mother's Day. Always. But there's a part of you that tells yourself that you're not so good, that you could be doing more, that the world is falling apart at the seams, and all you've been doing is yoga. One day, you see that the rainforest is being destroyed at a staggering rate of 32 million acres a year. That's the equivalent of one football field every 78 seconds. You feel bad, angry, guilty. You've been apathetic for too long. You want to do something about it. You must do something about it. Well, this is what you're not going to do. You're not going to quit your job, leave your family, get on the next flight to Nicaragua, take a bus to the edge of the jungle, then hoof it across rivers, lakes, and streams on a quest to the very heart of the rainforest. Take me to the heart of the rainforest. You're getting closer. You're almost there. You have arrived. You're not going to ingratiate yourself with the local tribesmen, go to great lengths to earn their respect and trust. No, 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 no. It is around now you realize you're living out the cliché gringo fantasy of becoming an honorary native and leading the resistant forces. But screw it. If they could do it, so can you. I'm gonna save you! This guy comes over here, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna pull his zapping bats right through him, right over here. You're not gonna coordinate and occupy the rainforest movement, realize it's hopeless, summon the power of the gods, lead a revolution against the deforesters and their multinational employers in an apocalyptic once and for all battle to save humanity <laughs> only to awaken two days later in an El Salvadorian hospital with two toes missing on your left foot Syria, what you <laughs> hobble out of Central America up through Mexico across the Sierra Madre where you break down have your first cigarette in four years accidentally start a wildfire killing off the endangered species that once served as your occupational distraction finally make it back home only to find you've been replaced at work by a guy named TJ and that things at home are not what they used to be. You're not going to do any of these things, but what you can do is follow the frog. Rainforest Alliance certified products ensures the future of our rainforests so that you don't have to do the things you shouldn't do anyway. Just follow the frog. So that is a, a little ad that a commercial that we've been running. Uh, and uh, it's done pretty well. You know, it's, it's been viewed about a, almost, I guess, 900,000 times in the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's good because it sort of uh, it gives you a positive solution about things that you can do, which is the, the uh, way that the Rainforest, operate, Rainforest Alliance operates. And it also uh, brings a little sense of humor to it. And one thing I was going to add is that um, uh, I often 
I often get asked to give talks because uh, I'm like this guy from Ohio that didn't have a background in science and started this organization that has grown and and try and leave people with this image. Well, if a, like like a you know a Joe Schmo guy like me can start an organization and and it, and build it up, then anybody can play a big role in making a difference on the planet. And you know, if there's one uh, message that I'd leave you with, it would be that that you know there are a lot of simple things that we as individuals can do to make a difference. Sometimes you won't be able to notice them all at once, but I think I believe in collective action, and collectively we are are able to make these monumental positive changes on the planet. You throw a pebble into a pond, and you may not see the water rise, but it does. But and when enough people throw a pebble, pebbles into that pond, indeed the water goes up. Um, okay, this is not part of my talk, but is this not one of the most ridiculous things that you've ever seen in your life? These, this is a grocery store where they have peeled the banana, the cover for the banana, and instead wrapped it in styrofoam and cellophane, thus creating and using a lot more natural resources than the naturally created skin of the banana. And these are the kinds of things that uh, are destroying the planet. And it's, some, it's just a lot, of, uh, a lot of, there is a lot of common sense. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Rainforest Alliance and where we are now, since it, I told you a little bit about where we were. I'm going to talk a little bit about a program called Catalog Choice that we also started. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the way I think um, the world is moving in, in organizations and what happens within organizations that help them succeed or help them not succeed. So the Rainforest Alliance, this is our mission. It's pretty practical. We are always trying to find solutions. We are always focused on work on the ground, first and foremost. But over the years, we have developed relationships with uh, quite a lot of companies. Uh, we did not intend to really be uh, as big as we were. We had no, you know, we didn't, you know, it's not that we're so huge, but our intent really was to only focus on how do you save biodiversity for future generations? Because 50%, if not more, of all the world's biodiversity is stored in and around tropical forests. We are losing tropical forests at a rate of 100 acres a minute or so. You know, the rate is still very high, and we wanted to help. And uh, over the last 25 years, the rest of the world has kind of caught up with the vision and mission of the Rainforest Alliance, and that was to create practical alternatives to deforestation that were both economically viable and socially desirable. We would never uh, go into an area where we, we would tell anybody what to do. We always partner. We partner with uh, companies. We partner with organizations. We partner with communities. And we straddle that fence between working with companies and uh, the, you know, the largest companies and the, and the world's uh, the, and the smallest communities on the planet. And, it, and it's, you, know, you have to really do a little bit of a juggling act to be able to do that. But we've succeeded for the last 25 years, and we'll see how it goes. As you can see, we, we um, most importantly, we've been trying to impact a lot of, of, of land and the, the way that the world works so that we can get to a uh, tipping point, so that all companies will uh, buy products in their natural state, manufacture them in an environmentally friendly way, sell them to, to uh, consumers who will better understand what they mean, what their source of origin is, and what to do with them at the end of the day. If we can create uh, a, a cycle like that, a cradle to cradle cycle where, where products can be used and then reused over and over again, and land can be uh, bountiful for hundreds of years, then we're on our way to a better planet. And uh, for a long time, companies were not really working with us, but there are companies now that are really involved uh, I recently was working with Paul Pullman, the chairman and CEO of Unilever, one of the largest companies in the world, and, and I was introducing him at an event, and he said, well, introduce me as, as the chief environmental officer. And I, I love that, because this is a guy who is committed to take Unilever to 100% sustainability by the year 2020. And he doesn't just uh, talk the talk, 
He understands these issues. He could talk to you for hours and hours about what we need to do around the world in order to fix the planet and how corporations can pay, play a positive role in that. Now, that's not always the case. So uh, about 10 years ago at the Overbrook Foundation, where I now work, it's a private philanthropic foundation in New York City, we were talking about uh, old growth tropical forest, old growth forest, and, and the waste of paper. And one of our board members said, can't we just get the catalogs to stop coming? And we said, well, we, let's take a look at that. So over a period of about a year, we developed a process for creating something called catalog choice. We did it by enlisting the support of three nonprofit organizations. And we needed to come up with a, a team of organizations because we were afraid that if we created this big mailing list, all these egos would be involved, and everybody would want this mailing list so they could, they could send to in order to raise more money for their membership roles. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So we came up with this thing called Catalog Choice. And uh, originally, we got a lot of pushback from these companies. There's something out there called the Direct Marketing Association. And they represent all the magazines and uh, the, the direct marketers. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And they didn't want a Catalog Choice a voluntary nonprofit organization out there giving consumers an opportunity to opt out of getting catalogs that they may have wanted or may not have wanted or may not have wanted to get every month. In fact, at one point when I was sitting down with a group of catalog owners from around the country, some of the biggest catalogers in the country, one of them said, consumers don't know what consumers want. We know what consumers want. And that just didn't feel right to me. And they said that if, you know what, we can mail, if we mail a catalog to a consumer one, two, three, four, five, six times, they won't purchase. But on that seventh time, or the eighth time, or the ninth time, we'll get them. And that also didn't seem right, because it seemed like an inefficient use of natural resources. We are, when, when the companies themselves were, were producing and sending about 20 billion catalogs a year, and they were getting a response rate a good healthy response rate of about 2% if they were doing well. So where were those billions of catalogs going? They were going into, the, into landfills. They were going straight from a person's mailbox directly into a garbage can or a recycling bin. It's a, it was a colossal waste of natural resources. So we, you know, a little foundation in New York City along with some nonprofits, we created this group called Catalog Choice. and. On, you know, in our first year of operation, we had hoped to sort of sign up like 50,000 people. In our first week, we signed up something like 250,000 people. And it was pretty interesting. People wanted it. People wanted to have more choice over their own actions, a positive way to conserve resources. We are all looking for things that we can do to make a little bit of difference on the planet. You know, uh, there is this book I read a long time ago by, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name, it's Tadeusz Konwicki called the Polish Complex. And this guy, it was, this is during uh, the, the bad times in Poland when they had very little, very few rights. And, and the, the, the guy in the novel, every morning woke up and he smoked a cigarette. And he said, everyone, likes to, everyone wants to commit a little bit of suicide on the sly. And, and what that's really about is taking control, right? Having something that you can do that's on your own that can either make a difference in a positive way or in a negative way. What we found through our research was that people truly were longing for more ways to take more actions on behalf of the planet. So in the same way that the Rainforest Alliance, you could buy a better banana or you can buy coffee from a certified source. Now, you know, envelopes and paper and, you know, there are uh, thousands and thousands of products that you can buy from certified sources. In the same way, we wanted to give people the option to uh, be able to not buy or not use products from different kinds of sources. So, so we, we did a pretty good job with catalog choice. We, uh, we started it. Instead of having a negative response from these direct marketing companies, and I actually, and the, the, the executive director who we had hired to run it, we got personal death threats or health threats uh, of the, you know, that they, these companies wanted us to go out of business. They wanted to, to buy us. And it was a, it was a very in intense period of time. But eventually, because we had the consumer support, customer loyalty, we are a nonprofit, 
we won the direct marketers over. And these companies like William and Sonoma that really didn't want us to play became our buddies. And they were able to work with us in downloading lists and take people off catalogs and, and go figure. They're, they've been able to save money. And we didn't put them out of business. And, and this past year, um, we sold Catalog Choice. We took it from an idea to a small nonprofit. We spun it off to a, a nonprofit with about 10 or 11 people in Berkeley. And, uh, and it started raising its own money. And, uh, and so this past year, we sold it to a company called Trusted ID. And all of the money that we earn after the enormous lawyer's fees uh, is going back into another foundation that will continue to support conservation efforts for paper and plastic reduction. So we consider that you know, kind of a victory, especially because they continue to run the program. They have to run it for free for at least three years. And um, what's interesting about Catalog Choice is that uh, over the last couple of years, it started to, we started to white label the program for cities. So in Chicago, in New York, in Seattle, you can, you can go to the city government site, and we will be behind that site. And you can opt out of not just catalogs, but all the rest of the mail. And you can opt out of phone books. And so it gives a consumer a way to take a little bit more responsibility for what they want to do and how they want to live their lives. Uh, so the title of my talk that I came up with you know, was for today was supposed to be Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast. And, and that was meant to really sort of uh, focus on how an organization is run and who runs it, or how, uh, how anything is run and who runs it, and how much um, uh, the, the feelings behind it, the, the, the sentiments behind it, will play a big role in the outcome. And I felt like on the way over here, I kind of had to change the title of my talk. And I wanted to make it, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, so I think General Petraeus here, I was going to put General Betraeus, but I thought that I didn't know if I would uh, offend anybody. Uh, this is an, an, uh, 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 an unbelievable example of how culture will eat strategy for breakfast. Because this is a guy who, the head of the CIA, who uh, decided to have an extramarital affair thinking that nobody would find out about it. I mean, it's the head of the CIA. I've been watching Homeland. I know how the CIA operates. <laughs> you know, and you know what's going on over at the FBI. They're laughing. They're going, you guys over at the CIA, you don't know what you're doing. But think about it. Do you think that the CIA had an emergency contingency plan for what do we do if the head of our operation uh, has an affair? And, and, and these are the kinds of things that make people scramble and throw, throw organizations, throw countries into a tizzy. You have to know, uh, you have to have some sense of, of how you're going to operate or who at the top is going to be running the show and how it's going to operate. And if you don't, you end up with chaos. And this is the same thing that happens with organizations. This is uh, my rendition of, well, it's not my rendition, I didn't make this, but this is chaos. This is a sense where things run amok, when there is no control of anything, and you just have no idea where it's going to end up, right? And this is, you know, one could think that our nonprofit sector, the entire nonprofit sector, from gay and lesbian issues to the environment to reproductive rights to, to everything, is where we are now. Because everybody is working on particular issues. There's not a lot of planning going on. We don't have a true sense of direction. So we, we, we don't know where we're going to end up. Now, this is planned chaos. This is the strategy, believe it or not. And I don't know how I got to it. This is my strategy when I was running the Rainforest Alliance. I knew I wasn't going to be able to control things. I knew that there wasn't a lot of experience in the organization. And we didn't want to stifle creativity. So we wanted to allow chaos to operate. But you wanted to have chaos with a plan so that you could have some sense of the direction. And you could have some sense of where it's going to go and end up. And you may have to take sidesteps along the way. Much in the way that I'm giving my talk today, I may have to go another way if something doesn't work out. But this planned chaos seems to be a much better way for creating an operation and uh, creating a, an organization. And one of the things that uh, General Petraeus showed us is that, that ego is a culture killer. right? You know, 
um, somehow people who, who are at the top think that they are immune from the law. They are, that no one is ever going to catch them, that there is a wall that separates them and everybody else from what is right and from what is wrong. And you can have the best mission in the world, but if you have an organization that has an ego at the top that is going to stifle the way that the organization runs, you're going to have a, a culture that is not going to lead to success. So you have mission, ego, culture, and somewhere along the line, if, if these get out of alignment, then it's going to be a big problem. And I have seen this. I mean, how many of, I'm sure most of you have run or have worked with organizations where, where the leader of the organization is kind of, a, kind of like a, a jerk. You know, and they're, they're not allowing people underneath the organization, you know, a, a different layers of the organization to be creative, to have work. And they're saying, no, 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 this is going to be mine and only mine. And they're going to block that creativity. And that's going to, you know, that's going to entirely change the culture of how things run. And I work a lot on founder syndrome with organizations. Founders of organizations uh, have a very difficult time letting go, right? It's their baby. They started it, they want to run it, and they want to run it into the ground if, they, if we let them. Uh, so one of the things that we don't do very well is transition from a founder to another executive director. And uh, we did it at the Rainforest Alliance. It was really hard. It was very painful for me when I pulled back from being executive director, hired a new executive director, and uh, wanted to stay involved. So I had to pull really, really back. And it, take, it took a lot of effort. And it was you know, painful. But but it has worked, and my relationship with our executive director, we've only had two in 25 years, has worked really well, and we, we have a great time and are very productive together. That doesn't always work. I have been in so many, you know, because it's worked, I get a lot of calls from organizations that are trying to transition and trying to figure out how they're doing it. And here's a situation that doesn't work, that, uh, that I've seen so many times. You've got a founder who is a great uh, visionary, but doesn't know how to manage at all. So they bring in another person to be a manager and the executive director, and the founder moves to another office down the hall, that, and they're going to work on something else within the organization. And, and I have seen that not work 100% of the time, because if you're in that office and you are the person who founded it, you cannot give up that control, and it just doesn't work. So. Uh, this, way the how, this way that nonprofits operate is, uh, is really, uh, it's really different, and it's really different from the way that for-profits operate. And um, I'm going to segue to talk for a second, a second about what's happening now in this for-profit, nonprofit world. And if you were at this earlier talk, you've heard the, me talk about this. And this is this emerging middle that is taking place within the nonprofit and for-profit sector, in that the for-profit sector is getting the hint that they can't just have business as usual, and they're starting to behave more like a nonprofit in that they're not just measuring by profits. They're looking at people, they're looking at planet, and they're looking at profits. So it's this triple bottom line approach. And they're starting to be more creative in the way that they have their offices. You know, if you go up to Cliff Bar in Oakland, you can see a climbing wall, and they can bring their dogs in, and you know, they're very enlightened. They've got great policies. So they're starting to act more like nonprofits. On the other hand, nonprofits are realizing they have got to, uh, they've got to shape up as well, and they're trying to act more like for-profits. They are paying more attention to their bottom line. They're looking at profit and loss, and they're thinking about what can they do to stay in business and be healthier. And they're bringing on, they're hiring a lot of people from the for-profit sector that are that have come from, uh, or they're hiring people into their nonprofit sector from the for-profit world. And that changes things as well. And then lastly, they're getting grants from foundations that have been set up recently that are based on measurements. And they're measuring. But what is the big difference between a for-profit and a nonprofit? Profit, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what is it? so what, what's the goal of a nonprofit? Sorry? Well, the goal of a nonprofit is service. Right? A nonprofit is established to, to carry out a service. Right? It's meant to do something to better the planet. A for-profit is, is, especially a public for-profit for company, 
has got to make money. That is their bottom line. If they have shareholders, that is what they are legally forced to do, to make money. And what's happening now with nonprofits and for-profits is that nonprofits are starting to act more like these for-profits, but, but wait a minute, they're measuring things that are different than, than for-profits because they're not, they're not about making money. And what we have is, is, is a disconnect that's happening within the nonprofit sector in that it's not about measuring, not, not all of these things need to be measured. Not all these things are valuable to be measured. I don't know if you know this quote, uh, that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Now, I always thought it was Albert Einstein, but I Googled it, and in fact, it's not Albert Einstein, and you know, this quote can be attributed to like eight different people, so I'm going to say I made this up. <laughs> uh, uh, but so what's happening with nonprofits is that uh, we're measuring things like our budgets and our column inches and how many grants that we're getting and, and uh, you know, how many donors do we have. And do these things really matter if we're not moving the lever, if we're not pushing ourselves toward making, reaching our mission? It seems to me that the only thing that a nonprofit really should be measuring on is mission. And the only way it's going to be able to move mission is by working collectively. So I'm going to show you the slide that I had earlier with the Rainforest Alliance. You know, we do it too. No nonprofit, almost no nonprofit that I'm aware of today is measuring correctly. And partly it's because we're driven by grant dollars, we're, we're driven by individual donations, and we're driven by media. We've got to get more attention, right? We've got to build ourselves. We've got to get out there. We've got to be bigger and better, and we've got to compete with the other nonprofits. And that is getting us to chaos. And I wholeheartedly believe that this, this passage of chaos, of measuring the wrong way, is not allowing us to solve the biggest problems in the world. So I asked earlier, um, you know, if anybody thought about what a movement meant, or a movement, you know, what a movement was. And, you know, a movement happens over time, and it happens in different ways, and we're all aware of them in, you know, certain movements throughout our history. We study them, right? Um, and it, things are changing right now in the world. We're seeing that at least in the environmental movement, we are not winning. We have had victories, and we have been successful, but we are not winning. We are losing the war on the environment. And this is even with a lot of companies pushing us in the right direction. And a lot of companies taking their own leadership and saying, well, you know what? Uh, the government's not going to act on climate change, but we are. We are going to start measuring our own climate. And we're going to, you know, and, and this, these are amazing things because the companies are saying things are so bad that we are going to have to to go around the government, and we need to really, as as customers, support and consumers support that kind of behavior because there are so many forces like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that are working against us, and many governments that are saying, oh, "I'm sorry, there are too many regulatory processes for us to make any kind of change," and. I'm sorry, but we're competing with each other. We're the United States. We're not going to take any action unless the rest of the world does or if China does. So we're not going to do it. And social media and the complex nature of the world is changing the way that the world is functioning. And it's only going to start functioning if we start to operate more collectively. Now, you may be thinking, is this a talk about socialism? But it's not really. It's a talk about survival. If, if in fact, the, the United States doesn't take leadership on climate change, we are unlikely to get climate change legislation. If we don't get climate change legislation, we are going to continue uh, burning fossil fuels until, you know, you could be a climate denier or not, until, uh, you know, our world is going to look very different. We can, as an environmental community, continue to operate in our same way. Like organization, organization, organization. 16,000 plus organizations operating just in the United States. And if we don't find a better way to coordinate and cooperate and lift all shifts, 
chips, then we are probably going to continue to move around along in this uh, area of chaos that I described. So what we're working on now at our foundation, along with a number of other organizations, is something that is tentatively called the Council for 16,000. We are trying to find a way to get uh, all of the organizations in the United States to come together to see if we can find commonalities, to see, for example, if we could create a strategic plan, an offensive plan that says, this is the kind of world that we want to live in. And I'm not sure if ever in our history, outside of the founding fathers that said, you know what, this is, our, this is the kind of world that we want, we're going to create a declaration of independence describing it, and what are the usurpations that have, have served us badly, and so why we're going to have to change the world. But right now, we need to find a way whereby we can envision the kind of world that we want to live in. We need to create a, literally a plan. We want to look at a world that says, or that, that you can close your eyes and imagine, that has, uh, has urban renewal, cities that work, skyscrapers that are extremely energy efficient, small apartments that work really well because most of the people, 70% of the world's people are going to be living in urban areas by 2020. So urban areas have to work with mass transit that's going to be very, very efficient. And there are people and there are organizations around the United States and around the world that are trying on small scales to create these kinds of environments. In, in England, there's there are something called transition towns that are trying to look at what is the transition from this unsustainable to a more sustainable environment. And this is the kind of, of activity that we're going to need to take. We are going to be able to, I know I said this, we're going to be able to close our eyes and say, this is, yeah, this is the way we're going. And my example is, the, is a, of a car, a good carbon eater, right? If you're in your car and you don't know where the roads are or where the roads are going, how will you get to where, you're, where you want to go to, especially if you don't even know where it is you want to get to. You just want to get to a better place. I'm going to get in my car this morning and I'm going to drive to a better place. But I don't know what that is and I don't, know how, and I don't even know what that looks like. So we're going to have to put numbers to it. We're going to have to put organizations to it. And it's going to have to be a lot more strategic. We are going to have to find a way for each organization to say, I am going to be an environmentalist first. I'm going to be a member of my organization, Sierra Club, Greenpeace, Rainforest Alliance, second. I am going to be a world citizen. And I know it's very hard to do when we're most focused on the things that we can see right outside of our backyards. But until and unless we are able to do that, we're probably going to be going so incrementally down a path or on a road where we won't know where we're going. And you know, I, I, the last thing I was going to say is that we're all responsible. We all have uh, a role to play. And again, if like a you know a, a schmo like me, seriously, you know, I mean, I all I wanted to do when I grew up was play baseball for the Reds. You know, I didn't uh, uh, start out wanting to work on behalf of the environment. It is not anything that was ever in my plan. You know, even when I started the Rainforest Alliance, I was a volunteer. I was just passionate about it. I had no intention of starting an organization. Uh, um, we all have our own journey. We all have, you know, if you're here, you've got some interest in the environment. You all come at this from a different place. But we're all ultimately going to be spokespeople. And we're all going to be the leaders that are going to take us to that new place. And, you know, I really, I mean, Unless someone like you cares a whole heap and lot, you know, or a whole awful lot, things aren't going to get better. There, you did it. <laughs> Thanks. So I've, we have time for a couple, some questions, if anybody has any questions. And if there are no questions, hi. Well, we're getting them already. 
Uh, so what we've done is we've tried to outline and be as inclusive as possible in thinking about this, and we're really focusing on small, medium-sized organizations and organizations led by people of color. Uh, we've been learning a lot about how a lot of organizations feel like they've been left out of the movement. They haven't been included at all. When they try and come to the table, they're pushed aside by the bigger or more established organizations. So it's really important for us to make sure that these organizations are included. And what we're also trying not to do is build this. The goal of what we, what we want to do is create an architecture around it, bring all these organizations together. That includes academics. Uh, that includes the you know, uh, farmers and fisher people, you know, anybody within an organization, and let them figure out what this, what this organization can do. And what we're trying to do is not tell anybody not to do anything, but we want to lift all ships. We want there to be greater capacity and greater cooperation. And we're already getting pushback. And so I've been in this field for 30 years, and I know a lot of people in the field. They're my friends. And a number of them have said, well, you know, there's already a lot of networks out there. And if you do this, you're going to take money away from the other organizations. Or, you know, this is way too ambitious. Or you're going to threaten our membership. So, you know, we are getting pushback. But it's the only thing that I can think of that is going to make a difference at this point. I mean, we continue at my foundation, and some of my foundation where I work, we're giving out millions of dollars every year to organizations working on sustainability and human rights and biodiversity, and they are band-aids. And it leads to incremental change. And ever since the environmental community lost climate legislation a few years ago, the environmental community has truly been lost. Everybody is walking around trying to uh, hunker down keep their donations, keep their membership, and try and figure out where to go next. And nobody is figuring out where to go next. And you know, there, uh, Bill McKibben, he started a group called 350.org. He's going around the country right now, this 30-day tour, where he's talking about um, we, the main thing we need to do is we need to divest from fossil fuels, we need fossil fuel industry. We need to tell the fossil fuel industry no. And that is, you know, that's a great thing to do. But you can only say no if you have something that you can say yes to, right? You have to be able to offer a viable alternative. So, so the only way we're going to get to an alternative is to come up with a, a plan. And the only way we're going to get to a plan is if we get these organizations to think out of their boxes. And you know, it's really easy to be in a box. Uh, I, I have a good friend, Annie Leonard, who did the story of stuff, the video that you should all watch if you haven't watched it. And she says about the environmental community, sometimes you're in a rut so deep it looks like a groove. And, uh, and that's, I think, kind of what happened to our community and some of the other communities. And we're gonna, it's going to have to be different. We're going to have to go to another place. The world is really changing. And we're either going to be part of the world that doesn't change, that sits back and you know, gets left behind, or we're going to be able to part of, be part of the world that does change and moves in a forward direction takes some risks, and gets comfortable with being um, you know, in a new place that we've never been before. And there are a lot of people out there who are doing it. And there are a lot of organizations out there that are trying it, especially in the world of technology. I mean, who knew? Who knew that I wouldn't need my fax machine? Or, or Federal Express, because you know, I could scan on my phone. I mean, the, the, the monumental changes that have taken place in the last 10 years are, are to me mind blowing. And even within the environmental community, within the past 20 years, where we've come from to where we are, it's really fantastic. You know, they, we, we were talking earlier, there were no majors in the environment. You couldn't study uh, sustainability 20 years ago. There were no books about it. And now the bookshelves overflow. And there are many places you can go to study it. And companies are leading. And, uh, and we're saving so many. Uh, resources in new ways, and it's and, and the, like buildings like this are built in a way that are, are can be models for the future for other for other buildings. If we continue to do this, look forward, think forward, act forward. You know, I I know that people can be pessimistic, but I'm not. I remain optimistic that we will think and work ourselves into a better place, into a better world. But it's going to take our collective action.
Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the parts of the council that we are trying to, to uh, look at is the broken nature of philanthropy. You know, right now what happens, and I'm a philanthropist, right? I work at a foundation. I give out grants. And we in the foundation community, we think we're really smart. So we think that we can go tell the nonprofits what to do with their money. And the nonprofits, they think they're pretty smart because they've got experts on the team, right? That's what they're supposed to do. And they're coming to us and they're saying, please, sir, may I help, you know, can you help us out with some grants here? And that's wrong because there's a tremendous power struggle. So I believe what should happen is that the nonprofits, as the experts, should be leading and the foundations, the philanthropists, should be supporting those organizations. And they should be, they should be measured differently. We should be measuring on how you are moving the lever, how you are helping to push your whole issue forward, how well you're working with other groups to help pull them along with you. And we're going to have to change the way philanthropy works as well because it's, a bit, it's about a huge power struggle right now. I have been in conversations with organizations where they're saying, well, my funders told me I have to do this, as the, the NGO is speaking. And that's simply wrong. You know, and I've done it before. When I ran the Rainforest Alliance, you know, we would sometimes chase money. I, I admit it. There was an organ a foundation out there, and they were giving out grants that, for something that, well, it's not really on mission, but, you know, we can create a program like that because it's going to get us another $100,000. And, you know, we know money chasers, and they're out there all the time because we're all hungry to get more money. Broken, broken, broken. You know, it's going to have to be fixed. And, uh, and do we think it's fixable? I do think it's, it is fixable, but it's going to require the philanthropist that foundation community to step back and go, you know, what are we really doing here? Why are we really in business? We're in business to support the NGOs. And, you know, and I have to admit, I am a huge hypocrite because here I am, a philanthropist, you know, working at a foundation, starting a program to get nonprofits to do something else. You know, so it's really hard. And I, I don't have, I don't, I, I haven't figured it out. Uh, I, any other questions? Well, so I don't want to do anything. What I want to do is create a space where the organizations can come together, be it state by state, and we have created, we have a business plan for it where there's, there's programs, ideas, and then a big portal in the middle that will connect these uh, the, the two things. And what would happen in a perfect world, or in at least better world, would be that, let's say you're in California, all the groups working on these things are talking to themselves, and they're going to get together, and they're going to create a plan, a strategic plan that says, in the next 20 years, we want this to happen. And we are going to go, and we are going to go to this legislature or to companies and say, here's the way we want it to work. And we have behind us every organization in California, every grassroots group and every one of their members. And if that had happened, when we were trying to pass climate legislation in Washington, if 16,000 organizations and their grassroots members went to Washington and said, here is our plan, and should you not accept it, you are going to feel the wrath of 16,000 organizations and their members. We would have climate legislation today. That didn't happen. We had a, you know, a, a handful of organizations and a power play that failed. And it's a big disappointment. So we can do things differently, but we're going to have to really do them differently. Uh-huh. On the UN negotiations? Well, not on the UN negotiations, but I believe that in order to get uh, anything ratified to work, two things are probably going to happen. One. The rest of the world is going to operate uh, outside of the United States and China. And they are going to take actions. And eventually, the United States will be shamed into acting. Or the United States, in this next four years, 
the Congress and the President will actually take leadership and recognize that this is truly a global problem and that a great majority of the problem stems from the United States' absence of leadership. And should that leadership somehow show up, then I think that we'll, we will we'll definitely have uh, uh, some sort of UN treaty ratified. It may not look exactly the same, but I think it can happen in, in you know, three or four years. But the clock is definitely ticking. You know, we are not, it's not like, it's not like I think 50 years ago. We, I do believe we are running out of time and resources and, you know, okay, we can go ahead and frack ourselves into, you know, another 100 years of energy, but we are also going to pay the price of that. The article that came out a couple of days talking about the United States becoming a net exporter of energy does not take into uh, play the, in the, the catastrophic situation, the catastrophic way that we are going to have to live with contaminated water. And nobody talks about environmental security or nuclear security, but now actually the Pentagon is actually talking about it. These are real issues. So we can have the energy, but at a cost that is going to be, that it's going to, that's going to come at the quality of our life. You know, and, and, and it's going to be impacting quality of lives all over the planet. You, one might think that we would first look at the alternatives before we start extracting and using up uh, more dirty energy. So I think we're out of time. Thank you for coming and um, uh, thank you.